Savannah is going to come rock the stage and spill all of the secrets around how to create high performing ads. But I wanted to first say at Motion, why do we do what we do and why do we put on events like this? So Motion is the home for creative strategy. And what that ultimately means is that creative is the most important lever for success in all of paid advertising. But what we also know is, is that there's a couple different types of people, teams, and brains that are involved. On one hand, we have our, our media buying folks who are data and analytical. And on the other hand, we have our creative teams who are exactly that, creative and conceptual. They need to operate in lockstep side by side so you're producing the best creative that makes you the most money. But there's a natural disconnect that's ultimately created. So at Motion, what we think about is creative strategy and being the home for creative strategy help bridges the gap between the two brains, minds, and types of people. And today, what we're really going to be digging into with Savannah and, and truncating our questions around is the creative strategy flywheel. So if you follow these steps, you're able to out, uh, output the best creative possible. And why we like to hone in on this is because when we think about how this work usually happens, it usually happens in a spreadsheet. And can I just say, media buyers, I feel for you. I know how much time it takes to put into this thing and all of the effort it takes. And creative teams, I might feel for you even more, in all honesty. The effort to actually try to look at creative as numbers seems so painful. So at Motion, we like to run these events because we make it easy to analyze, visualize, and then share in action upon insights across the board. Okay, folks? Fantastic. That I would like to welcome Savannah to the stage, please. Hello. Hey. Thank Savannah, you so, so much excited. for having me. I'm so excited you're here, Savannah. Like the community loves you. Everything's going well. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so excited for this. I am in love with the motion community. You guys are blowing up the chat and I just can't wait to dive into all your questions. Like you said, I, I don't do these super often where I get to just do live Q and A. So I just can't wait to hear what, what you guys have to ask and uh, for us to all learn from each other. It's going to be incredible. So everybody, if you didn't know, and you're just living under a rock, this is Savannah and she is absolutely incredible. Someone I deeply respect. She's an absolute savant when it comes to all things, making high performing ad creative. And she's going to bless us with her knowledge today. Um, Savannah founded the social Savannah, which is one of North America's top five most popular TikTok creative uh, exchange partners. And she worked with over a hundred brands in 2023, including Fabletics, Dr. Squatch, and Athletic Greens, the name of you. So there's no one better that we'd want to be able to learn from. So chat, you're already blowing it up. Let's show love, please. We have to, we have to. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so excited for this. We're really going to dive into some, some hard hitting questions about the process and, and what it really takes to make a great ad. So this should be a, a really awesome session. The questions are already flooding through with all of the votes that are coming up. So Savannah, before I, before I get into the questions here, I did want to do a little bit, honestly, Harry kind of asked it here, like 2024, it's a new year. And I think what we are curious about to pull Harry's question on stage here is based on your creative testings, what frameworks and concepts are converting uh, well right now for you. And I think of it as like ad formats, what's absolutely crushing it for you on this front. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as ad examples are, of course, best shared with a deck. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yeah, we got you. Awesome. So in terms of frameworks and types of ads that are working the best right now, we're still seeing the TikTok style, UGC, testimonial, talking to the camera style, really crushing. It's what worked best in 2023 and in the first quarter 2024, this style with the organic TikTok text overlays is still number one. Uh, I wanted to just quickly start off with some components of every great ad. So every ad hook format, it all needs to still have these great elements to convert. And the first things first is that ads must have amazing lighting. So I'm working with creators must be filmed in bright, bright lighting so that the ad footage comes out well. Next, we wanted to make sure that every ad looks organic to TikTok. People are getting more and more blind to things that look like an ad. So you want to make it look like it's almost like I'm just sharing a day in my life, whether it's like a styling video or get ready with me, making my dinner, things that people organically come across on reels and TikTok. I would say 
thinking about what's different between 2023 and 2024. In 2024, more brands are asking me for more organic looking content. They're telling me, don't do like three reasons why ads, don't do formulaic. Like we want it to look like a regular TikTok. So that's been a big trend in the last month or two is brands wanting to look more organic while still featuring their product, of course. Next think, big, oh, go ahead, Evan. I was just going to say, I think like along that thread, so one of the second most upvoted questions, and I'm going to let you keep going with the slides. No, go ahead. But it's like, if there's other ones, if there's in that similar theme of what brands are asking you for, as you're going through the further slides, if there's any specific concepts you think are heating up as well. So Kyle had a question around like, what's actually heating up in addition to like, what do we know works? Um, sorry to throw you off a little bit, but just, uh, no. just to make sure I got to Kyle. Yeah, please, please throw in, throw in the questions. I think that those are really great. Cool. Um, I would say like one big data trend that I've noticed is, and this is like going to the data in motion, of course, is making sure that you have a voiceover with text overlays. Uh, voiceover ads have been doing really well, um, especially in the first quarter. So that's, that's a big ask that I'm getting from brands too, is they're saying everything must have a VO uh, as opposed to just like a styling video with just like nice music in the background. And then of course, one of the biggest things that I ask that brands ask me for is like the talking to the camera, compelling testimonial, utilizing green screen footage. That's really what brands are looking for. They're looking for creators that can authentically tell the story of their brand and seem very genuine in talking to the camera and have that social proof of other people have tried it. This is why you guys should try it. And here's how it's improved my life. So that's something that a lot of brands struggle with is trying to find creators that can speak authentically and do these type of testimonial videos that continue to convert on Meta and TikTok. And one thing to add along to that is the energy of the creators is incredibly important for the success of the ads. No one wants to listen to someone just ramble off product value props. Oh, I really like these shoes because they are really stylish. Like you gotta be interesting to listen to, like popping with your voice, your facial expressions. That's what you gotta get people to stop the scroll. Like just talking to the camera and rambling off product benefits is just boring. So you gotta find a way when, whether you're a creator yourself or you're working with creators to really bring that high popping energy. And that's the creators I see perform the best. And that I go back to time and time again are the ones that I recognize have really good energy. So that's something that I think people don't really look for in creators, but is to never be overlooked. Great. Is there any background noise or is it okay? It might be a little bit on my end and I might have to mute myself. So I feel okay, like no maybe problem. I need to adjust I was, I was my language. I was worried to sound it was like me. You know. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Um, and then next is just making sure you're having good acting and good storytelling. Again, that goes along with finding creators that can tell the story of your brands in an authentic way. And then lastly, if you're not doing a testimonial ad, one of the ad angles that is working really well, especially coming off Q4 is gifting angle. So girl buying for their boyfriend, girl buying for their mom, buying for their husband. These are type of ads that are crushing a lot in the last month or two, especially it's like the gifting angle ads and showing like the boyfriend or the kids in the ad and watching them receive the gift. Uh, that's something that's been working really well. So that's it for me in terms of slides. Um, for but just wanted to share those ad examples off the bat so that you can see what type of ads are performing the best right now and what the key things to look for in creators and and the styles of ads absolutely incredible i i feel like we need to talk in those boring voices now and switch it up it's like how's it going savannah is this a good <laughs> and bring it down that way yeah um but everybody so we started off nice and strong and set the stage for being able to say like, this is what we see working to kick off the year. And this is some of the stuff that's heating up. I just wanted to bring everyone's attention back to orient us around like what we're actually chatting through. So where I wanted to jump to is actually skip over research and building out these different pain points and personas. I actually wanted to talk about ideation. 
because once we get to this phase here, it's so important to like figure out what to build. And honestly, Savannah, like you're one of the first people I turn to when I'm thinking about inspo for hooks, new ideas in the account and all that good stuff. Um, and I'm assuming it's the same for everyone here today. So for yourself, like, how do you find your creative inputs? Where are these ideas coming from? Where is your go-to source to get these ideas? What, um, what can you share on that piece? Yeah, definitely. A lot, of, a lot of it comes down to just me on Instagram or on Facebook coming across ads and saving them, screen recording them. This is a habit that I've gotten into for literally years where if I come across an ad, I'll screen record it, I'll save it, and then I'll organize it in a Dropbox, whether it's by like food and bev or by beauty. So I try to organize it in categories. And then this also helps if you can involve your team. So if you work on a, on a marketing team, have a Slack channel where all you guys do is share ad ideas or good inspiration that you come across, uh, or even an Instagram chat where you can share with the group chat. When you come across a really great uh, Instagram story ad, you can just share it to that group chat. So having multiple people contribute to these like groups of sharing ad examples have been really helpful for me. And then I like to use Foreplay which is a tool where you can organize your ads into um, different categories. So I'll just quickly show what my foreplay dashboard looks like. Um, and what I've been doing, which has been helpful, when I come across an ad, I will categorize it into like eye-catching hooks. So like something like writing this on a piece of paper or like typing on the screen. I'm so mad I didn't buy this sooner. Or like- They gave me free shots for life a really cool transition. So I try to organize it by like, what is eye catching and I'll put it in here. Or for example, stitch incoming is a type of like TikTok trend that's working really well in ads right now. So when I see a good stitch incoming ad, I will save it to my stitch incoming board. Or if there's like TikTok trends that I think could be good inspiration for ads or transitions that I think are really cool that I, I think I could replicate for another client, I'll save it to my transitions board. So that's how I like to think about ideation is spending a lot of time on Instagram and, and TikTok and then either downloading it and saving up these ad examples. And then of course, like you can use a, a tool like Foreplay to organize it more efficiently. So that's, that's my creative ideation process. Having everybody tapped in, speaking the same language is so important. So if you're all contributing to the Slack channel, like that's super clutch and I think helps a ton. And I think the piece that, that you're so good at, and you'd mentioned earlier is like finding the right creators who can then represent the brands and put together a product that you're ultimately happy to, to run with. Right. So yep. I think what a lot of people are curious about is like on your end, how do you go about finding the right creators, sourcing them and all that good stuff? Yeah. So the way I work with creators is probably different than a lot of other agencies. And I think that's why we're so successful. We have a really small, but highly trained creator team. Some of these people I've found just on TikTok, like they have like small followings, but I can see that they have great energy. They're great at talking to the camera. They have really good like bathroom or like bedroom set up, or I'm like, that could be really good for ads. So I almost feel like I'm like a talent searcher. Like I'm like one of those people that used to walk around the mall and be like, you should be a model. That's how I feel when I'm on TikTok and Instagram. These people that don't know that they're going to be future ad stars, they're not like advertising themselves as like a UGC creator or a TikTok influencer, but I'm like, you have potential. And so I take those people that have like less than 10,000 followers. I can see that they have potential and I train them from the ground up of, how to do authentic testimonials. I send them loads of ad examples, shot lists, and I, I, I really train them to be a great creator. Um, but it's all about finding people that have the basics down. Like they know how to do good lighting. They know how to authentically talk to the camera. Those are things you can't teach, but if they have that, you can teach them how to do a really great unboxing or what type of scripts lines we would need for an effective ad or how to do a good try on. And it all comes down to providing them with visual examples of the shots that we're looking for and, uh, and the script lines. So I'm really big on providing a very thorough brief. And then what happens is with these creators that I'm working with, so I currently have 40 creators on my team, but when I started doing this three years ago, I had one creator and then slowly added two and then five and then 10. So 40 is like a huge jump. But for a long time, I would have like a group of like 10 or 20 girls, all between 25 and 34, and I would work with them every single week. 
so that they know exactly what Savannah is looking for. They know the type of styles, they know the type of feedback I'm going to have. And once they get in a groove of creating ads for different products every week, but they know what type of styles I'm looking for, then we really get in motion, no pun intended, of getting really great content. Because now some of these creators have been on my team for over two years, some even over three years. Uh, these are really long relationships, so I'm working with them every single week. And that's why I think we're, we do such great ads in such a short period of time is because these creators are just like, they, they understand the machine now and they, they understand the process. I feel like we have to unpack that. That was incredible. Like so many gems in there. First of all, talent scouting and like finding the irreplaceable to align up with like the high energy, great lighting and all that stuff makes a ton of sense. But the one piece like I don't want to, I don't want to like leave in the back burner is the training element. Like training is so hard. Anyone who works with people in general, like knows it's such a challenging thing. So I'm not asking for the entire like curriculum, more or less. But what I'm curious about is if you could offer one or two pieces of advice for anyone who's tuning in today, like what would you recommend that you need to get right when it comes to the training side of things? Yeah, and so many agencies and brands get it wrong. And I know this because I work with creators and they'll tell me, oh my gosh, this onboarding is so thorough. You guys make it so easy. And I'm like, really? Like this, I'm just giving you what I think would be the basics, but it's it's really showing to show that brands aren't giving creators ad examples that's number one is like show them visually what you're looking for like when i'm thinking about an ad i'm thinking about it in terms of storyboarding like we're going to need a shot of you trying on something in front of the mirror like that's shot number one shot number two unboxing it on your bed make sure you're filming it at 5 p.m when the lighting's coming through your window so i'm storyboarding each shot and then they're like, okay, this is easy. And I'm providing even clip examples of like, this is what a good try on looks like. And they can visually see, okay, that's what it is. This is what a good voiceover sounds like. Maybe that's just because it's my learning style. I'm such like, I, I need to see it to know what you're talking about. But that's something that creators also really re uh, resonate with uh, is the visual side. They want to see exactly what shots you're looking for and examples to go back to. And that's how I've been training creators is, is by being really thorough and then by providing uh, very specific shot lists and script lines so that there's no, um, there's no misalignment of expectations. They know exactly what's expected from them. And I'm trying to make their job as easy as possible. I think brands fail sometimes because they're just like, you're the creator, you, you got this. And then what they, and they come back and then they're unhappy and then they're gonna ask for a hundred revisions for the creator, which then damages the relationship with that creator. And it's all downhill from there. So preparing the, the brief and the scripts and the shot list, the inspiration, that's what takes the most time from my side. The creator's actually filming it. They can film that all in like 30 minutes, an hour, um, but you have to make it easy for them. Um, otherwise it doesn't work. So your briefs are just super thorough and making sure people are set up for success that way, right? Yeah. And I, I feel like there's two schools of thought. There's always the people that are like, let creators be creators, which is, I just haven't, that's just not how I work with my team. Ours is, you are very great at what you do. You know how to film, you know how to talk to the camera. I'm paying you for your skill set. I'm not paying you to be the creative strategist. I need to be the one to do the storyboard, to figure out what shots are required, what script lines are required. I think it's two different roles. But brands can often think that the creator needs to also be their creative strategist, which is why the creative strategist role has been so popular and definitely growing, uh, which is amazing. So I think separating the two and understanding that they're just the, the practitioners, that's going to give you the greatest success of what you're looking for. If you can be the brains behind it and then you're hiring them to put it all together, but don't rely on them to storyboard an ad or figure out which, which shots you're going to need to put it all together. That is super helpful. Um, and I think like in this theme of, of finding the right creators to partner up with, Darla has a question that I'll pull up and very curious to get your opinion on it. But what is your recommended platform for finding and creating partnerships between UGC creators and the brands themselves? This is one of my most asked questions <laughs> and it's probably my most boring answer because I've only used TikTok and Instagram to find creators. I've even found people kind of randomly, like like through like my sorority, there was girls that were part of acting, like um, 
acting clubs and stuff. And I just recognize that they have the look, they have the acting chops and I've trained them. So it's, some of them have been kind of random through personal connections. Like I said, I'm like the talent scout. I'm like, I think you could be good at this. Um, if, if they have acting experience and, um, and they have the right look, but a lot of it just comes down to searching hashtags on TikTok, looking at trending videos, trying to find those creators with under like under 10,000 followers is kind of my threshold because I want them to still be small. I don't want to pay the big influencer prices. Uh, and that's just not the type of relationships that I've found to be successful. I found finding like the really micro creators on Instagram and TikTok is really the best way to go. No, that makes a ton of sense. And I feel like not only creators, you'd be great at hiring, but just your team, like just for everyone's context. I don't know if I'm spilling the secret beans here, but whenever I meet Savannah's team, it's literally like, oh, this person used to be a creator. Now they're a creative strategist and they have this evolution. So the training program works in what Savannah's uh, describing. And I can go to bat for on that one for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's been really cool. Like, cause I, I started with one creator on my team and now she's managing all the creators and pretty much running the show in terms of like giving all the direction to creators, finding inspiration. But in terms of all the creative strategists on my team, they all started as creators. I think that's a really interesting pathway is starting as a creator, being behind the camera, understanding what it looks like when you're giving them the storyboard and then having them actually be the ones, once they understand the formula, it's like, oh, they can come up with their own storyboards for other creators. That's been a really cool pathway, but so hard to find those great people. It's definitely, definitely rare. So I would say like, if you do want to be a creative strategist, start as a creator, like actually like pick up the camera and like see how hard it is and like what, what type of shots it takes. Cause it's a totally different creative mindset, but both complement each other really well. But when you find both that someone that's good at, at filming themselves and creative strategy, those are called unicorns and you gotta hold on to them forever. I love it. And, and so far we've come to the place of like finding the right creators, building a roster of creators, training them, and then ultimately upskilling along the way. Now, when we're thinking about ideating, it starts to turn into what do we actually start to make? So Ryan has a question that I quite like here, but how do you think about or incorporate stages of marketing awareness in ads? And do you evaluate them differently based on that stage? He puts IE stage one verse five, but like pre-problem aware, problem aware, solution aware, product aware, like that type of stuff, essentially. Totally. I think a lot of brands miss out on this. They're always thinking about just prospecting ads and every ad is following the same script of here's the three reasons why the product is great. But there's a lot of products, especially when you're thinking about products that have a high AOV. So think about products that are over $100 there's a long consideration phase and there's a chance that someone's going to need to see multiple ads on multiple platforms over a period of time before they end up buying. And it's a shame if you, every touch point they have with your brand and your ads is just you saying, we have this, this, and this, we're really great at this. It's like, okay, we already, I already got that on the first ad that I saw a month ago. Now I want to see customer reviews. I want to get deeper into the social proof. I want to understand why the price is worth it. Is this a good value? What's the warranty like? What's the ship? What's the special offer? There's completely different messaging strategies that you should take for retargeting versus prospecting. And that's something where the large brands that are successful that have a higher AOV, they're really zeroed in on that. They're thinking about what messaging strategies is best for someone who's been to our website, but didn't purchase. Is it the price that's the biggest issue? Do we need to get more social proof? And I think a lot of brands miss out on that when they're just saying the top three value props over and over again at every stage in the funnel. And I think just to draw it back, like we kind of skipped over that research phase and jumped into the ideation side of things. So when we're thinking about like the stages of the problem of prospecting and, and retargeting and the different problems we solve, how much of that is attached to a specific persona in your work, let's say, and like building out who you're solving for or like identifying the problems um, that you're solving from like reviews or wherever source it might be? Sure. I would say it comes down to really two categories for retargeting it's tackling price and then tackling uncertainty of like is this is this a, like people are still worried like is this a scam is this even going to show up is this product going to break on me so depending on your product it's going to be a bit different of which one's more important but ultimately at every demographic someone just wants to know is this going to be worth it and is this legit because with online products it, people just have such low trust and so figuring out okay, if, if your target demographic is a mom and 
45 plus, then it's simply about getting a mom that's 45 plus as that testimonial on screen talent, talking to the camera genuinely and being like, I was a little bit skeptical about this, but I tried it and this is why it's so awesome. Like my kids love it. I love it. Um, they had this great, they have this great shipping. It was super fast. So identifying who's your target person, having them speak to the camera and say, this is why I also was a little skeptical, but ultimately why I think it was worth it. I love that. I love that. And now moving more to the formats. So how do you, from Australia has a question, how much weight do you put behind video creatives for static creatives for the brands you work with? I would say most of the brands I work with, it's an 80, 20 split between 80% video, 20% static. There's a couple special exceptions to this in apparel and, um, like accessories. We actually see that those brands do a lot better with static ads versus video. And that's because for the reason of like, if you're advertising a purse, we often just see like a really nice photo of a purse that's stylized, it's in good lighting. That's what works the best because people are visual. They can know just off looking at a photo. Do I like the style of this purse or not? With apparel and accessories, it's so much just about, do you like it? If you like it, click to the website and get it. Um, where you're not like really explaining the value propositions of like a cute pink top. It's just, here's a cute pink top. So that's what I like to think about is like, if, if it's a very visual product, then typically in a camp, there's really no value props other than it looks good. That's when static ads work better, but for like health or wellness or, um, like skincare, that's when you really have to show on a video. Here's how it works. Here's the efficacy. Um, here's, here's my unboxing experience, but you don't need to do that for like a, a cute pink top. People can just see that on a model and be like, I like it or they don't. And then they keep scrolling. That's a really simple way to put it. I feel like I've, I've, I've over-engineered videos in my mind to be like, oh yeah, it solves the problem in these steps, but I've never thought about the static side that way of just like, Hey, if it's so obvious, let's just make it that way and meet them where they are. So that totally. makes so much sense. That makes and, so much sense. And the same thing for video, like sometimes with the most simple videos do the best, especially for visual True. products. It's just like, even if it's just like a very slight motion, it's only one shot showing the, the, um, the shirt on a model just for like five seconds, like a different angle. That's what will work the best. And then like the whole like unboxing and testimonial and three reasons why like that, those don't work well at all for those type of products. So sometimes just being super simple, showing the product in the first three seconds and beautiful lighting and making it look good. That's what's going to get people to click to the website um, versus you rambling on about why it's so great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. And and now we've come to the place of like, we have an idea of what we want to shoot and we're being as detailed as possible within our briefing process. And now it brings us to the actual creation portion. So one of the things I'm so interested about, about your process is like everything's shot on an iPhone, right? Yep. <laughs> so everything's so shot simple. on an iPhone. <laughs> I, that's incredible. That's incredible. Now I'm wondering if there's just any like tips and tricks you can give to people, uh, around like how they can be successful when shooting on an iPhone. Honestly, if there's anything you're willing to share here, I think it'd be super valuable for everybody. A hundred percent with paid social ad creative speed is really the name of the game back in the day. Like this is four years ago when I worked in an agency, we would rent out a whole studio, get the cameras, get the, the actors. We do all this, sh the shooting and editing over the course of a month and come out with a couple ads and they flop. And then it's just a big expensive failure. Really the name of the game with paid social is being quick, getting out new ads in your ad account every week. That's why when I'm working with clients, the production timeline is Monday through Friday. We shoot on Mondays and Tuesdays. We have the creators do the shot list with their iPhone. We give them that very specific shot list. I usually try to get them the shot list and the scripts by Friday. And then they have the weekend and Monday to film. Uh, they film Monday, Tuesday. We edit on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And then I get the ads to the clients every Friday. So speed is really the name of the game because creatives fatigue so quickly on Meta and TikTok. You want to make sure that you're getting out as much output as possible, still while being thoughtful, like utilizing best performing hooks, the formats that work well. But if you, I would say always prioritize filming on your iPhone and even editing on your iPhone, like utilizing apps like CapCut is a really great one. Um, CapCut also has a desktop app. If you can ship out ads within a couple days that you're going to see a lot better success and a lot, and you're going to get data back faster about what's working. That's something that brands run into issues with. They spent all this time making an ad, making it as polished as possible, making it on brand, my most hated word. 
Um, and then it just takes so long to get data back. Now they're spending $50 a day on it. And it's like, okay, now we're three months later and we're just figuring out if there's statistically significant data to support if this ad concept was worth doing in the first place. Like, that's my worst nightmare. I'm all about volume and speed and then getting significantly, uh, like significantly statistic statistically significant spend behind the ads within a week so that we can go into motion and be like, was this successful? Was this not? How can we uh, utilize these metrics into next week's production. So the speed is so important. And in our, and in our world, it's like everything you said there, it's like, you need the data and you're going to learn no matter what at this point of what we can start to do next. Totally. So uh, the piece in there that I, that I quite liked is like the SLA. You really have figured out Monday to Friday and like what's happening in the first two days of the week first Wednesday ed editing and then Thursday, Friday, so on and so forth. Yep. So one of the big things I did want to call it was the editing side. Like we definitely, that's where everything comes home. So just to be super clear on your end, the creators create the raw assets, your team receives them. And then you have dedicated editors who are then like producing the final piece, correct? That is correct. And then that goes back to letting people do what they're good at. The creators may not be the best editor. Yes, they can edit their own TikToks. And I'm sure they, they, they get by just fine on their own TikTok page. But if you have an editor on your team, like I said, the ones that I've worked with for years on end, they know the styles I'm looking for. They know that we need cuts every X amount of seconds and we want this type of text overlays. Then you, because every ad style is pretty much the same. We're utilizing the same TikTok fonts, same TikTok comment question overlays, keeping them all around 30 seconds, um, putting the hook, the most intriguing shot in the first three seconds. Everything is really formulaic. So yes, there's going to be variance in terms of getting creative with the hooks and the scripts and the concepts. But in terms of the editor's job, they are doing, they're, they're really doing the same thing over and over again in terms of this, the type of ad, the type of style. And so if you can get someone really in tune with your styles that work well, again, sharing access to motion about what we're giving them reports and the, and the tools that they need to say, to be like, oh, these are the type of ads that are working well. These are the type of hooks that are, are, that are converting. These are the type of cuts that are working. Being able to visually show that to an editor, they're going to learn week over week. And then by the time you've been working with them for six months or a year, they're like a powerhouse because they've done a thousand of these ads and they're just continually learning um, by looking at the data. And Savannah, within this line, there's another, there's another um, a hiring question and people question similar to how do you find the right creators? So Caroline's question is hiring video editors, best practices, where to find them. And I'll add like the training side of it too, because performance creative is a little bit different. For sure. I've had really good luck on LinkedIn, uh, good old LinkedIn uh, for, for finding editors. I mean, with editors, it's it's, it's all about looking about uh, their portfolio. This TikTok UGC style ad is now so common. When I was first started hiring ed editors like three plus years ago, like doing like these TikTok style type of ads, it was really hard. So it was actually a much harder learning curve because these are editors that used to do like YouTube videos or long form videos. And I'm like, no, we're doing it 30 seconds, quick cuts, TikTok text. They're like, okay. Um, but it's so popular now. So it, it, it I, I think it's actually probably never been easier to find great editors where they're going to have a portfolio of this TikTok style content. And I always try to keep an open mind because I'm, I'm like, okay, well, I know that I like to do things a certain way, but is this person trainable? Do they understand how to do like basic animations and text overlays and clean cuts and beat matching with the music? And then of course, then I can train them on like, no, I want to use these specific fonts or this client really likes this. Um, so that's, that's easier to train, but I will say it's probably never been easier now that like this TikTok style format is so popular. It's going to probably be in every editor's portfolio now. Something I've selfishly learned about you is just like, you're the number one talent scout. Like if we're talking all roles in creating strategy <laughs> and UGC, seems like you crush no matter what. <laughs> finding great talent is really the key to this. Like whether it's finding good creators, finding good editors, finding good strategists. And I think it all starts with doing it yourself. Like I used to star my own UGC ads. I used to edit all the ads. I used to come up with all the ad concepts. So you kind of have to do it to appreciate it. Doesn't mean you have to do it forever. Like I try not to star in ads anymore um, just because it's, it's too much. But there was a time like four years ago where I spent the whole week shooting ads of me talking to the camera. And so now when I'm talking to creators, I can speak their language. I'm like, 
I've done this. I know exactly what you need to do. I understand about lighting. I understand this. So I can help coach them. So doing it first, I think will help a lot. Um, even if you just do it at a basic level, like I'm not a, a big editor, I'm just a cap cut editor, but, um, but I know what type of styles work and I can prove with data that it works. That's the biggest thing is like being able to say, here's the top styles across every client. Here's the top hooks. Being able to provide that data is what really changes the game, whether you're presenting to clients or to your internal team and helps them understand much quicker about what type of ads we need to be producing. If you can show them with the data, especially because it's changing every week, like these reports with that we have the emotion are refreshing on a daily basis. So it's really part of our process that every week we're looking through what's the top ads, what are the top performing hooks, where can we iterate? Like we don't always create new concepts. Where, where are the opportunities to iterate on, on our old best performing concepts? Um, so that's, that's my process. Incredible. Incredible. And I, and I have a couple, I think, super relevant questions that I saw. I saw one of them come up in the chat, so I don't have it to bring on stage. And then another one about AI. But the first one that I saw come up in the chat was related to this like new theme we've been hearing of UGC is dead. <laughs> so it's just like things are changing. UGC is now dead. And I'm just really curious about your take on that in terms of like definition uh, of like what that even means and then opinion of like where this goes in the future, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, I, I feel like at the start of this, like four years ago, when I started doing UGC. I used to hear UGC doesn't work for us. And I'd be like, what does that even mean? And I would see one video they shot with one creator. It didn't have any of the elements that we talked about today with good lighting, good, good cuts, good testimonial, good storytelling. I'm like, of course it didn't work. But people like to say it very broadly, like, oh, UGC doesn't work. But then you look at their account and I'm like, well, here's the reasons why I think it's not working. The, they're, they don't look, they're not, this creator isn't that exciting to listen to. There's nothing interesting that they're saying. They're kind of just rambling off uh, product benefits. I'm like, would you stop on this ad and click? So I think it's it's never been more difficult, especially on Meta and TikTok to break the scroll. And that's why you have to spend so much time and energy thinking about how can we be more creative? How can we be better than our competition in terms of ads? I would say when they say like UGC is dead or more difficult, I think they're comparing it to maybe a couple years ago where you just got away with doing less. You can send a product to your a creator, they do a simple unboxing or testimonial video. Didn't really have any of those elements of like being scroll stopping or intriguing in any way, but those ads worked. Where now it's more difficult and CPMs on these platforms are rising, competition's rising, and now they're like, oh crap, what, what used to work isn't working anymore, which is true. So I would say it, there's it, it's kind of a juxtaposition of, Yes, UGC is still like the top performing ads in all my clients' ad accounts. Like it's all these, these type of videos that I showed in that deck, but it's just about who's executing it the best, who's the best creators, who's having the most intriguing hooks. As marketers, we just have to step up and get better to see success. It's not like an easy win anymore. Uh, so it's not like a, it's not something that you can just half-ass essentially. <laughs> Such a good point. And your deck literally explains that. Like, I think a lot of people wouldn't be sure about what half-assing it means. And like, it could even be said, if you just pass it to the creator and cross your fingers, like that's kind of half-assing it at yep. that point. Right. So it's that's, just like, that's what everyone does. <laughs> everything's layering. Yeah. Okay. And another question that Omer has, which is very relevant now in the AI piece that I was messaging, mentioning, Omer is asking, how do you think AI will influence UGC content creating and the style of ads as you move into the future? And I'm also curious just about your general thoughts on AI, let alone just related to UGC. Yeah. So you, AI and UGC is really interesting. I'm using it. I'm utilizing AI in a couple of ways. One of the ways it's really helpful. I'm using a software called otter.ai. And what I'm doing is when I'm getting testimonial clips from creators, I put it through the software and it will transcribe in like text what the creators are saying. So that way, when I'm giving the briefs to my editors on my team, I can easily copy and paste the lines. Back in the day, I would just have to listen to the creators do a testimonial and I'm like typing out every word. So that was an inefficient use of time. So I, I love AI for like time saving hacks. You can also use AI in Dropbox now, which we're playing with. Like if you search in Dropbox for like beach clip, it'll show all the beach clips that we have, which is cool when we're making like mashups of ads for clients. If we want to show 
uh, clips in different places. It's still not super smart yet. It's, I think it's, it's something that's like just rolled out, but it, that's something I could see being really helpful in the future. If I'm searching for a specific clip for a client and I can kind of describe it and it will come back to me with those files, I would find that to be super helpful. So that's kind of on the cusp right now. AI and ads, I think is really cheesy right now. Like I've seen AI generated ads and I just cringe. <laughs> There's a, and I don't know. I, I don't like them. I, I don't see them being top performers for my clients. Usually when I start with a client, I'll see in motion that like they used to run a lot of AI ads and then they start working with me and now they're, those are all phased out. It's kind of like the easy way, but I just don't think they're really effective. And then a lot of them are using the same AI voiceover. Like there's like this Cali girl AI voiceover that's really popular right now. And so I'll watch a bunch of ads and they all have the same AI voiceover. And I just, there's, there's something that's like not authentic about that. Like I want to hear like a real person talking about the product. I think the whole robot voice thing is a little overplayed and people are becoming skeptical, especially because like it's very popular with drop shippers and stuff to use like the AI robot voice. So if you want to not associate your brand with what drop shippers are doing, the general rule yeah, the, of thumb. <laughs> help, helping your workflow is a big thing. And I think the framework that I've heard a lot related to AI is like it's a, it's really helpful on the time saving but we're in the business of performance at the end of the day. Of course, you wanna draw some efficiencies, but the goal is to make even more money because creative is gonna get you there at the end of the day. So you might save time on spitting out that AI created asset, but is it gonna make you more money? And then from what you're describing, it's like, hey, come to the, come to the I won't call it the dark side, but come to the right side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the whole thing with like, with Meta and TikTok becoming more competitive and CPMs going up. If, if you're just churning out AI ads, which is essentially just copying other people because it's just utilizing like old inputs and variables to what they think is going to be a good ad, you're never really going to stand out. And that's the thing that I try to think about with my ads. It's like, what's something that we can do that other brands aren't doing that's not tested? Because uh, AI can't compete with that. It can't compete with like coming up with a brand new hook or something kind of out there or scroll stopping. So you'll never really get those like out of the box ideas, at least yet from utilizing AI ads. And that's, you need those out of the box ideas and those really great clips in order to see success on these platform nowadays, because it's just so much harder to stop the scroll. Everybody, we're coming to the last 13 minutes here. So please get those questions in up, 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 up vote. We have to, we're going to start rapid firing at some point, but Savannah, we've been making our way around that gauntlet right? I'm actually going to jump now over to the point of, hey, these assets have been in market for quite a bit of time or however that long that time frame is. Uh, and a question that Julian has that lends itself so nicely here is what's your framework slash process for making new versions of already winning ads? And I'd add like, what's the analytics and analysis process look like? How are you then making decisions and anything else you're willing to share? Definitely. Can you see my motion screen <laughs> on screen share? Sweet. So as you, as you all know, I'm, I'm a big fan of motion. And one thing that I like to do when I'm thinking about iterations is looking at which ads have the top thumb stop rate. So this is probably my most used report. And this is one where I'm pulling in thumb stop, click through rate, click to purchase and hold rate. And so when I'm thinking of making iterations for new ads, I want to figure out first if, if there's any ads where I can keep the first three seconds the same but then change the body of the rest of the ad. So if I see an ad with a really strong thumb stop, so this one has 24%, what I'll think about doing is making the same ad, keep the hook the same first three seconds, but then I'm changing the body. So maybe I'm using a different talent for the body. So the body of the ad is just anything after the first three seconds. Maybe I'm changing the talent. Maybe I'm changing the script. I'm changing what value props we're looking at and how I decide which ads are ones that have a really great body. So after the hook is this hold rate metric. So which ads are holding people to the end? Are they watching the whole thing? So I might see an, in this data, it's not as obvious, but I'll often see situations where an ad will have maybe a so-so thumb stop ratio that it has a really good hold rate. And I'll look at it and I'll be like, oh, they're mentioning these three value props or they have this really compelling offer. That's what's making people watch to the end. And then I'll pair that with an ad that has a really great thumb stop. So I'm almost like trying to figure out the ingredients. Like what, what's the ingredient in this ad that's making the thumb stop good? And what's the ingredient in this ad that's making the hold rate so good? And then you combine it together and then you get your perfect ad. 
So I really am, I would say like on a weekly basis, I'm going through and I'm creating iterations where I'm keeping the hook the same, but changing the body, or I'm keeping the body the same and changing it to a best performing hook. So I'm just chopping and changing clips. And that's why it's really important to get raw content from creators, like in my process, so that we can go back to that raw content library and be like, oh, what was that hook that was performing well? Oh, let's take this hook, then let's let's combine it with this body that's doing well. And then you'd put them together and you make magic. So, you know, I love that and being able to think about it modularly. I think like uh, one step before this that we have a question from uh, Paige from is actually even related to the scheduling and SLA that you had described. So the question Paige has here is for testing ads, what is the best length of time the ads are on to have real learnings? What if I test ads and they don't get any spend within the first week? Uh, and any thoughts you're able to add there, Savannah? Yeah, that that. That's a, a problem I think a lot of advertisers run into. I always have a rule of thumb that you want to spend at least 4x your AOV on an ad before deciding to kill it. So if your average order value is $100, spend, try to aim to spend 4x your AOV within a week, ideally, so you can get data back quicker. Spend $400 on that ad before deciding is this worth killing or not. That's something I really get in trouble with with brands is I'll, I'll make them a great ad and then they'll spend like, Ten dollars on it, and like, oh, the click through rate was really low, and I'm like, ah, spend ten dollars. So, <laughs> making sure you have statistically significant spend, getting out of the learning phase, which is typically fifty conversions a week on any ad set. You want to make sure that the media buying part is 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 supporting your ad creatives. You don't want it to be where you're making all these great ads and they're not getting spend, or you're just making decisions on them too early. I, I, when a brand pulls up an ad that spent fifty dollars and they start talking about the metrics, I'm like, no, no, no. Dude, we're not talking about any metrics yet. This is Facebook's still trying to figure out who to serve your ad to. And even if you have like a brand new ad account or a new product, Facebook and TikTok, they need to do some testing to figure out who's converting on the ads, who's clicking on it. Facebook and TikTok aren't like smart from the start. Like they need data in order to optimize the algorithm to figure out who's going to purchase on the ad. So giving it time and money, that's what's going to make the performance go up. It, it's really a shame when I see brands like spend twenty dollars on an ad and they're like, ah, oh, the the CPC is too high. But I think brands are getting smarter. That's more of conversations I would have like a couple years ago. I think now brands are really getting in tune with machine learning on Meta and TikTok, the learning phase, Advantage Plus campaigns, all like the the automation stuff. So that's pretty cool to see. Everyone's leveling up, including these questions. So I'm going to start rapid firing. Right, at I'll, you give, right I'll try to give short answers too, so we can get through the mo most of them. <laughs> oh, we will not. There are 58, so we'll have to save some of them for the other time. But the 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 top voted question right now is from Libby: How to hop on trends while avoiding copyright slash licensing issues? Yeah, we like to recreate trends. So like we'll literally make our own audio that sounds like the original audio, but it's different enough. And then of course you can't use copyright music. So I like to look at trends that are more evergreen that don't require copyrighted music. If it's a sound and you can replicate it yourself, even better. Fantastic. And then another one here is from Montez. What are your experiences with creating creatives for digital projects, especially in digital wellness? Thanks. So digital products in general. Yep. Digital products, best performing ad type is the green screen format. So being able to show like a screen recording of your app, of the digital product, and then someone's face over it, like talking about their experience with it. That's the best ad type that I've seen for digital products. We're flying now, everybody. So you're in for a treat. So Sean asks... Best practices for marketing and advertising the Gen X and baby boomer generations. I would say they they typically perform better when you're doing longer form ads. So usually like a minute to two minutes. Like they like the more like explaining testimonial. They're more willing to sit down and like listen to someone talk for two minutes. Where when you're talking to Gen Z, you can't even get them to listen for two seconds. So that's the biggest difference is the attention span. So you can really dive into the product demonstration a bit more. I love that. A lot of people ask me which, uh, which, what I think about ads, and I'm like, I'm a baby boomer in my heart. Like, I'll watch those long as hell ones. <laughs> so it's funny. <laughs> uh, Lindsay's next question here is POV on using AI for voiceover versus actual person doing the voiceover. 
Yeah. I mean, I would say it's worth testing, especially if you're on a budget. And like I said, if you're prioritizing speed and getting out as many assets as possible, I think it's worth testing in your workflow. But I would say on a personal note, I find it to be a little ingenuine if you're always using the robot voice. And like I mentioned, the dropshippers always like to use the, the robot voice. So I would say test it, test it. It's worth testing, but I would say don't solely rely on it and make sure to look at the data to see if your ad with the real voiceover versus the AI voiceover performs best and go from there. Test it all. And then in the spirit of testing, Chris has a question here that I'm wondering if you have insight into when you work with the brands, um, what does your creative testing campaign structure look like on meta and TikTok? Broad, <laughs> no audience ta targeting, broad audiences, throwing it all in an ad set and then letting meta and TikTok decide which ones to spend the most on. Uh, I know it's it's not super sexy, but that's what a lot of brands do. Some of them will have like a creative testing campaign where it's like a specific campaign and ad set for brand new ads. And they'll have like a winning ads campaign and ad set that will have like the proven winners. So I like that way of separating out the ad account. It's like the, the creative testing campaign and then the proven winner campaign. But pretty much all my clients are utilizing broad audiences or like Advantage Plus shopping um, really utilizing AI on the meta and TikTok side to do the targeting for them. And Savannah, there's a couple questions now that are related to like UGC creator rates more than anything. And I think through like a couple of different lenses. So yeah. uh, I'll chat through both here. So Raphael, how much are you paying your creators? Are they on a monthly retainer and how many videos are they contracted to create for that dollar? And then in a similar spirit, Katya asks, how do you negotiate uh, rates with UGC creators? So I think it's just like the general concept of compensation here, if you're comfortable speaking to it. Yeah, I'll, I'll give some points to that. And that kind of goes back to when I say like, I'm trying to find those like hidden gems. Uh, hidden gems is another word for inexpensive, uh, undiscovered. <laughs> um, so if you can find those people on TikTok and Instagram that don't have a big following yet, but have potential, you're going to get a much better rate. I always like to have the creators tell me what, what, they want to get paid and figure out if that works with me. And if their performance is good over time, then we can discuss raising the rate. So I, I, I try to, I try to put it in their ballpark of what's, what's an hour of their time worth. And on my part, I'm, I'm trying to, I have to also sell myself of like, I'm going to be super organized. I'm going to tell you exactly what shots you need. I'm going to tell you exactly what scripts you need. I'm going to provide you ad examples and I'll show it to them. And I'm like, this will take you an hour to do because I'm going to make it easy for you. And that's going to determine, and I'm not going to ask for any revisions if you just do what's on the sheet. And so that's where I can get better rates than if you are just saying like, oh, you, 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 you come up with an ad, you try it. That's hours of preparation work. Cause now they have to do the research. They have to do the store, all that work that we have to do. You're putting that on them. Of course, it's going to cost more, all the editing, um, all the thousands of revisions you're going to have for them once, once you're not happy with the product, cause you didn't, put the work into the storyboard and the brief for them. It's not what you thought. So I would say the, the easier you can make for them, they're going to be happier and they're going to be able to give you a better rate. And if you have these long-term relationships with creators, like I do, then you can work out, okay, maybe instead of hourly, we do a monthly retainer. There's, I'm, I work with creators in so many different ways in terms of payment structures. So it's something I'm always testing out, but th that's my main advice around it. Makes a ton of sense. And I think we have one time for one more question, everybody. So I'm going to, I'm going to cherry pick. I'm not going to lie to you all. Um, so I think the one that I'm curious about is ending with a 2024 theme question. So going into 2024, what dimensions should creatives stick to for cross platforming between TikTok reels and meta? So it's like, can you use the same creatives across platforms? Is that something you should do or how should you view the world? Yep. Right now I'm making ads in both four by five, which is like the tall rectangle and nine by 16, which is the one you would use for, uh, stories, reels, TikTok. Those are the two main formats that I'm working with. Four by five is great because it looks really great on Facebook mobile and on Instagram feeds. And then nine by 16, of course, is the full screen experience for, for stories and, and TikTok. So those are the two dimensions I use. Savannah, Absolutely incredible. I want everyone to literally drop like the goat emoji into the chat or anything to show some love. So you absolutely crushed it. Thank you so, so much for, for coming on and sharing all the, all the knowledge and wisdom you were able to. Of course. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. The chat was amazing. I've just been watching it blow up. So 
Thank you so much for everyone uh, for joining. And if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me on my website, which is the social Savannah, the contact form on there. If you want clarification, if I wasn't able to get to your question, uh, I'd be happy to reach out to you directly. Amazing.